This is a quick guide to the Albatross D1 and D2, part of the lead up to the D3 which has been requested by one of my subscribers. I determined that it was impossible to tackle the D3 without first addressing its predecessors. The D1 and D2s were German biplane scout fighters of World War I that saw service with the Deutsche Fliegertruppe on the Western Front from August of 1916 through to mid-1917 with their use trailing off towards the end of that year. On the Eastern Front, the D2 persisted rather longer, with orders for the type being placed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire in December 1916, reaching operational status in May of 1917, and lasting at least as trainers until early 1918. By February 1916, the Fokker scourge that had lasted since midsummer of the previous year had been blunted by the French. Their stockpiling and then mass use of the Newport 11s had pretty much eradicated German air superiority, and the introduction of new types, such as the Halberstadt D2 and the Airco DH2, resulted in a stalemate in the air war over the Western Front, with the Allies having the advantage. At this point, the aircraft being fielded were not the result of lessons learned during the Fokker scourge, but improvements in aircraft design and thinking regarding their use. 1916 was to prove a pivotal year in terms of warplane design, and was to see the design and first flight of several influential types, some of which saw service to the end of the war and beyond. Examples include the Albatross D3, the Royal Aircraft Factory SE5, the Spad 7 and the Sopwith Camel, though tactics and technology had yet to evolve to make full use of their potential. This is, incidentally, a huge oversimplification. As a result of the experience learned during the Fokker Scourge, German pilots were calling for a small, light, single-seat biplane akin to those that had defeated them. An early response to this was the Halberstadt D2, which at best achieved parity with their opponents, although it is important to note that this was a design that predated the request. It was the Germans' first biplane fighter, and probably the best available until August of 1916. At this point in the war, Albatross Flugzeugwerke had been in operation since December of 1909. It had been established in Johannesthal, Berlin, by Walther Huth and Otto Weiner for the purpose of manufacturing aircraft under license. This naturally expanded into design work, which from 1912 was led by Robert Thelen. Of historical note is Thelen's involvement with the Wright Brothers Company in Berlin between 1910 and 1912. He can also be regarded as an early aviation pioneer, showing an interest while studying for a diploma as a mechanical engineer. The subject of his 1909 thesis was Antreibsmaschine für einen Flieger, or in colloquial English, aircraft propulsion. From the outbreak of World War I, Albatross had been producing reconnaissance aircraft, their successful Type B and C models, notable for being powered by inline rather than rotary engines. This is a potentially important distinction in German fighters and may help explain why they were able to implement a decent interrupter gear and more powerful armament much earlier than the Allies, as synchronization proved easier with inline engines compared with rotaries. Additionally, the use of inline engines provided important strategic advantages to the resource-challenged Germans in that they are in principle more efficient and use less oil. And yes, I know the Fokker Eindecker used a rotary engine. As this channel moves forwards, this is an area I would like to investigate more, along with all the other subjects I have mentioned over the last year or so that have been passed over with the comment, I may do a video on this. Design and development of the D1 and D2 occurred more or less simultaneously. It's almost as if Robert Thelen was working out improvements to the D1 design on the fly, and rather than implementing them on that aircraft, instead used the D1 as a testbed, with the intent of more or less skipping it in favour of the D2. This approach would have had the advantage of getting a desperately needed aircraft into pilots' hands more quickly, 
If so, it might be an example of any decision made right now is better than the perfect decision made too late. Needless to say, the two aircraft are quite similar. They were of wooden, semi-monocoque design, which saved weight by removing the need for the traditional internal bracing. In fact, the fuselage design was the same for both, being of a flat-sided ovoid shape. The engine bay was partially sheathed in metal panels, especially along the upper deck, which served to include the mounting for two machine guns, Maxim LMG 0815s in German service, and one or two Schwarzloser MO712s in Austrian. The reason for the difference in armament was availability. The same inline engines were used in both, namely the Mercedes 160P, although the Austrians again differed by utilizing an Austro-Daimler 185P. Austrian manufacture of Albatross aircraft was undertaken by Österreichische Fleugzeug Fabrik. Only 16 were produced, but this manufacturer becomes important in the story of the D3. It's interesting to speculate why the Austro-Hungarians were late adopters of the D2, especially with the D3 following on so quickly. Now, I haven't been able to find a specific description, so I shall speculate. The first reason that occurs to me is probably the armament. The Schwarzloser MO712 is not a machine gun particularly well suited to the installation of interrupter gear, firing as it does from an open bolt, compared with the Maxim gun's closed bolt. This took time to resolve. The second reason is possibly a combination of cost and requirements. The air war over the Eastern Front lacked the intensity of the Western Front, and designs obsolete in the latter could still see valuable service in the former, so why spend the money? Also, with the D3 so rapidly available, the D2 was quickly surpassed. The primary difference between the D1 and D2s was the wings. This can be seen in the pictures I have displayed previously. Where the D1 affixed the top wing to the fuselage via an inverted V carbane, this hindered pilot visibility upwards. In the D2, this was replaced by an N-shaped construction that permitted the wing to be lowered significantly and improved vision. Radiators were switched in production of the D2 from Windhoffs, located in the fuselage, to Teves and Barn installed in the upper wing, but these were sort of worked in rather than making a clean switch. Both aircraft, with their relatively streamlined fuselage and distinctive propeller spinner, were sleek and rather attractive, and set a look for Albatross Scouts that has become iconic. Flying tests of the D-1 commenced in June of 1916, and the aircraft proved to be fast, rugged, but not particularly manoeuvrable. Now, not particularly manoeuvrable is an unhelpful description, I grant you. One of the issues I have with descriptions of aircraft performance is that they are often treated as an aerial combat form of top trumps, I'm showing my age here, and subtleties are often overlooked. For example, one aircraft type might be faster than another, but have lesser acceleration. Maneuverability can rely on pilot skill as much as the potential of the aircraft itself. One relatively common qualifier is the phrase, in the hands of a skilled pilot, which is accurate, but overlooks the fact that in the hands of a less than skilled pilot, an aircraft might be downright lethal. A classic example is the Sopwith Camel. Another issue is the reaction of pilots in the field to their opponent's new type, which can be overstated due to simple surprise. Tactics also play a role. National pride cannot be overlooked either. The upshot is that an objective evaluation can be difficult. All my personal qualifiers notwithstanding, the D-1 and D-2 were ordered into production and began to appear on the Western Front from August of 1916, to the consternation of the Allies, whose main scouts at the time were the Newports 11, 16 and 17, and the Airco DH-2s. They had by this time enjoyed air superiority for several months, so the introduction of a faster and more heavily armed opponent came as an unwelcome surprise. 
One informal evaluation by Royal Flying Corps pilot 2nd Lieutenant Edmund Llewellyn Lewis, flying DH-2s with 24 Squadron, sums up the situation. It rather feeds you up to see all this newspaper talk about our supremacy in the air. We certainly had it last June, July and August, but we haven't got it now. The Huns still keep to their side of the line, while we venture over their lines, but if they wished they could sit over our aerodrome with their fast machines and we could do nothing against them. What I mean is that a DH is no longer attacking, but is fighting for its life against these fast Huns, and that at present we have only about half a dozen machines to cope with them. But I suppose war in the air will always be like that. First one side has the best machines, and then the other, and the side which shows most guts all through will be the winners. During this war, first we had the lead with the BEs and Vickers, then the Germans got it with the Fokkers. After that we got it with the DHs, and now the Huns are a bit superior with their fast scouts. Lieutenant Lewis remarks were well founded, and on december twenty sixth he was shot down in flames in his air code DH two by Lieutenant Koenig from JASTA two, most likely flying an Albatross D two. The new Albatross aircraft certainly outperformed the Newport elevens and sixteens and the air code DH twos in terms of speed and rate of climb. However, on paper at least, the Newport 17 should have been an able opponent, being of similar speed and possibly more manoeuvrable. However, German strategy had evolved by this point to operating mostly behind their O-lines, allowing them to dictate the terms of combat and giving a substantial tactical advantage. This became particularly evident during bloody April of 1917. The D-1 and D-2 arrived pretty much simultaneously, although production of the latter significantly outpaced the former. What may be surprising to you, my listeners, is the really quite small numbers of aircraft fielded. Total production numbers of the D-1 was 62, including 12 pre-production aircraft used for evaluation. D-2s were manufactured in larger numbers, totaling 291. At its peak, 214 were in service on the Western Front in January of 1917, which reflects quite a high survival rate after five months of production and combat, but also a drop in the intensity of aerial fighting during the winter. With such relatively small production numbers compared with many of its contemporaries, it is worth asking why these two aircraft are of such significance. There are two reasons. Firstly, their introduction was a shock to the Allies. Secondly, they paved the way for the D-3, which I shall cover next time. But suffice it to say that the D-3 followed on very rapidly from the D-2, undergoing flight testing around about the same time that the D-1 and D-2 were entering combat service. However, that is a story for later. <laughs>